out the notes, then it's it should be fine. Yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, say, say that. Okay. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, no more technical issues. Um, so uh, today I, I want to talk about um, common sense knowledge and reasoning in natural language. Uh, I do have a lot of content here, so um, if you can tell me before, how much time exactly do we have? The talk itself. Uh, I think it's uh, one hour. Uh, and uh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah, it should be fine. Uh, okay. So, um, wait, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, in the last uh, three years, uh, essentially all of NLP models are based on uh, pre trained language models. And um, if you look at the uh, leaderboards, like uh, SupraGlue, um, that, that's the way we measure progress quantitatively in, in NLP today, then it seems that they uh, surpass human performance on, on multiple uh, complex language understanding tasks. Um, so my question is whether um, this means that language understanding is solved or uh, nearly solved. And um, are we really uh, where uh, popular media depicts us. Um, for example, here, um, translation is approaching human level accuracy, um, AI beats humans in reading comprehension, etc. cetera. Uh, and if not, uh, then what are the remaining challenges? Um, so in this uh, pre-training fine-tuning paradigm, uh, these large language models like BERT are uh, first pre-trained to read the, the large text corpus, such as uh, the, uh, the web or Wikipedia. And as a result, these models learn about syntax, word meanings, uh, factual knowledge, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, the standard way to use them is to fine tune them on a specific uh, downstream or some task. And the fine tune, and for example, uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, and the fine tuning step is responsible for both um, making the model understand the task and also, um, or the format of the task, and also um, learning to solve it. Uh, however, we do have a generalization issue. Um, and this is something that has been shown for multiple uh, models and not just in NLP, but in machine learning in general. Um, so uh, it has been shown that supervised models learn to uh, tend to learn data set specific spurious correlations instead of solving the underlying task. Uh, and it was first observed for um, in, in computer vision tasks. Um, so for example, an image captioning model uh, failed to recognize an object when it was placed outside their, its typical environment. Uh, for example, here, uh, predicting horse instead of alligator because um, the models learned from the, the training examples to associate the environment of grass with the object of horse that tended to appear together. Uh, in uh, visual question answering, uh, these models learn to predict the, the most common answer in the, in the training set for a specific type of question, regardless of the image. Uh, so for example, answering how many questions with the number uh, two. Um, and uh, this um, state-of-the-art NLI model uh, predicts that um, I only had a soup, but it was very filling contradicts that I didn't eat a salad, although it should uh, entail it. You can uh, think about it for a second. Um, and th probably because it has seen negation mostly in a, a contradicting hypothesis because of the way that this data set was collected. Um, so the bottom line here is that models are uh, very good at solving data sets that they were trained for, but uh, they, they don't necessarily um, solve the underlying task. Sorry. <laughs> don't necessarily solve the underlying task and um, they, they often tend to be brittle when they're tested on out of the main examples. They tend to be, um, and, and when they are right, they are often right for the wrong reasons. Um, so first, I, I'm going to talk about common sense in this, um, in this talk, and, but first I need to define it and it's not very well defined, um, but I'm gonna go with the working definition that we had in our uh, ACL tutorial last year. Um, so we define it as the basic level of practical knowledge and reasoning concerning everyday situations and events that are commonly shared among most people. Um, so that includes uh, different types of common sense, for example, um, the um, uh, physical common sense, such as knowing that it's a bad idea to put your hand on top of a hot stove, 
uh, social common sense, like knowing that it's impolite to comment on people's weight, um, temporal common sense about typical times and durations of events, uh, and so on. Um, and the question is, why do NLP models need common sense? Uh, and the answer is because if we want them to be able to generalize and to um, behave reasonably when they encounter situations outside, outside their uh, training distribution um, and not make these unhuman-like mistakes that they currently make, um, they have to have some basic knowledge and reasoning abilities to, to handle these situations. Um, and here are a few examples. Uh, in translation, sometimes the system needs to uh, translate implicit meaning in the source language explicitly through the target language. Uh, for example, grass-fed yogurt um, should be translated to the equivalent of uh, yogurt uh, made of milk from grass-fed cows. Uh, but here it's translated to Hebrew um, to the equivalent of yogurt with grass, which is pretty disgusting. Um, in reading comprehension, sometimes we come across a complicated uh, headlines such as this one. Uh, Stevie Wonder announces he'll be having kidney surgery during London concert. Um, so there are multiple um, syntactic interpretations for this sentence, but uh, common sense can help us eliminate the alternative uh, interpretation that Stevie Wonder uh, performed during his own surgery. Um, and probably more importantly, if we're going to use our um, th these language models for, uh, for example, for training uh, medical chatbots, then uh, they need to have uh, social norms and ethics in order to not uh, advise people, uh, patients to kill themselves. This is actually something that happened. It, it was a mock patient, but um, during um, just a test, but still it's, it's pretty concerning. Um, so in this talk, I will, I will focus on uh, language model based models for common sense reasoning, because that's what, that's what we do now in NLP. Uh, and we will talk about two types of problems. Uh, the first one is problems that require uh, completing unstated knowledge. Um, and this would be uh, introspective knowledge acquisition through asking questions. And then the second part is going to be about advanced reasoning, and specifically, I'm going to focus on uh, non-monotonic reasoning. Uh, and finally, I will uh, discuss the open problems and future directions for uh, building models with common sense knowledge and reasoning abilities. Um, so let's start with uh, introspective knowledge acquisition through asking questions. Uh, in some tasks, we need to employ our implicit common sense knowledge to get, the, to, get to the correct answer. Uh, for example, um, look at this sentence, uh, children need to eat more vegetables because they are healthy. Uh, syntactically, the word they can refer either to children or vegetables. Uh, and to resolve this reference correctly, we need to reason about knowledge that is implicit in this context. Uh, for example, that vegetables are healthy, uh, that eating vegetables can make you healthier, and that people generally want to be healthy. And then we correctly uh, predict that the uh, they refers to vegetables. Um, inspired by uh, discovery learning, which is a method in uh, education, we can view this as a process of um, self-asking questions and answering them. So we have this human learner, and uh, they may self-ask a question such as, what are the properties of vegetables? and then um, answer it with their existing knowledge. For example, that uh, vegetables are full of vitamins, that they can make you healthier and, and so on. And then using this knowledge, they can discover uh, new facts such as uh, that they refers to vegetables or um, a chain of reasoning with additional facts that eventually lead to the correct answer. Um, so um, in, in an EMNLP paper from last year, we. Uh, propose the uh, self-talk paradigm in which we replace the human learner with a neural language model, uh, which obviously doesn't perform as good as humans. Uh, but uh, the, the goal was to solve a question answering task and the means is um, this nested QA component in which uh, we can ask clarification questions. Um, the input to the self-talk model is um, a multiple cho cho choice instance. And uh, it consists of a context. Uh, here it is, uh, children need to eat more vegetables because they are healthy, and a set of answer choices such as children and vegetables. And the goal is to predict the correct answer. 
Um, the model consists of a knowledge discovery component as well as a question answering component. Uh, the knowledge discovery component starts with the context and then uh, concatenates the prefix of an information seeking question, such as what is the purpose of? Um, then using the language model, we can generate the ending of that question. Um, so overall, we get the nested question, what is the purpose of vegetables? And assigning the ending into the corresponding uh, nested answer prefix, we get the purpose of vegetables is um, then again, using the language model, we can generate the ending. So we get, uh, we overall, we get the um, nested answer. The purpose of vegetables is to provide a good base of nutrients and energy. Um, and then we can repeat this process multiple times and keep all the nested answers or clarifications. Um, and the output of the knowledge discovery step is this list of nested answers, which are then used by the question answering component. Um, the question answering component uh, builds this, um, this table of um, um, the combination of the context, uh, creating a statement for each combination of the context with an answer choice and one of the nested answers. Uh, and then we would like to predict the answer choice corresponding to the most plausible statement. Uh, but we don't really have a good way to measure plausibility. Um, so instead we use the standard proxy of language model score. Um, and specifically, it is computed by uh, inputting the statement to the language model and then predicting or computing the conditional probability of each word given the previous words uh, and taking the uh, negative average log of the product of probabilities, we get the cross entropy loss. Um, so the lower the loss is, the more likely the statement is considered to be. Um, Language model score is not a perfect proxy for plausibility, and we will get back to this uh, soon. Um, so um, the question answering component predicts the answer choice corresponding to the statement with the lowest cross entropy loss. And this is the overview of the self-talk model. Uh, we evaluated the model on six multiple choice question answering tasks pertaining to different types of common sense knowledge. Um, so first we had social common sense knowledge using the um, um, social IQA data set. So here's an example. Uh, although Aubrey was older and stronger, they lost to Alex in arm wrestling. How would Alex feel as a result? One, that they need to practice more. Th uh, two, ashamed or three, boastful. And the correct answer should be uh, three, boastful. Um, we also evaluated the model on um, typical causes and effects using the COPA data set. Um, so for example, the man broke his toe. What was the cause? Uh, one, he got a hole in his sock or two, he dropped a hammer in his foot. And the correct answer is two. Uh, and also uh, we evaluated the model on physical, temp uh, temporal and general common sense knowledge. Um, as baselines, uh, first we had the ablation of the nested QA component, um, which basically just uh, verifies that adding knowledge to the model helps. Um, so we're just um, scoring the answer choices based on the language model score of the combination of the context with the answer choice with no clarifications. Um, we also had a set of baselines that use um, external knowledge from different sources. Uh, so for example, we used ConceptNet, which is a common sense knowledge base uh, to obtain knowledge such as uh, vegetables are required for, uh, for eating vegetables. Eating vegetables is motivated by being healthy. Um, we also extract such knowledge uh, directly from a text corpus uh, by just looking for the occurrences of uh, content words. So for example, we can get something as, like uh, vegetables are healthy, uh, as well as a lot of noise. Um, and finally, we use Comet, which is a model um, trained on the um, atomic knowledge base. Uh, and without getting into uh, details, um, Comet can reason about people's mental states and um, causes and effects. So for example, here, it tells us that the cause for the context is that uh, children wanted to live longer. Um, not quite accurate, but uh, funny. Um, what you see here is the average accuracy across the, the six tasks. Um, the takeaways basically from this work uh, were first of all that um, this nested QA uh, component improves the performance. So um, 
it was self talk was performing better than the baselines that um, didn't have this additional knowledge. And it also performed similarly to the baselines that used external knowledge. But in both cases, the performance is still far from human performance, also still far from supervised performance, but that's a different um, issue. Um, so there, there are plenty, of, there's plenty of room for improvement on these tasks. Uh, specifically, one of the challenges uh, we had was how do we get the model to um, recognize what knowledge is actually missing and uh, what knowledge would be the most helpful to ask about. And uh, there's nothing in the model that actually um, um, that makes it uh, try to, to ask these kind of these type of questions. Uh, and it is quite challenging, I think, to design such, a, such an objective, at least. It is uh, challenging for me. Um, another challenge is what I uh, mentioned earlier is that we don't really have a good way to measure plausibility in zero shot models. Um, and um, this is something we address in a different paper um, led by Ari Holtzman and Peter West at UW. Um, and um, so I'm going to uh, look at a different example from the one we're using so far. Uh, I think this is an example from Common Sense QA, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so a human wants to submerge himself in water. What should he use? Uh, a, coffee cup, B, whirlpool bath, C, cup, or D, puddle? Uh, the correct answer should be B, whirlpool bath. Um, the standard proxy to compute the probability is, is to compute the uh, language model probability of each answer conditioned on the question, which is basically what I also showed for self-talk. Um, so here it's gonna be um, um, the answer such as whirlpool bath conditioned on the um, some version of the question, like a human wants to submerge himself in um, water, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, predicting the answer that gets the highest language model probability. So that's the standard. Uh, one of the problems here is that this language model score uh, has two confounders. One of them is the uh, string length. So generally shorter strings would be uh, more plausible. And the other one is word frequency. So um, more frequent words would make the statement more plausible. Um, putting aside differences between word count and subword count, uh, when we normalize by length, which as you can see here is the uh, one over N, uh, we basically remove the first confounder. So um, I'm going to focus on the second one, which is the frequency. Um, so the problem is that when we use uh, language model probability in, in this um, unsupervised setup, we, um, the, the probability is distributed, is distributed across the entire vocabulary, not just the, the constrained space of candidate answers. So if we have different strings re representing the same concept, such as uh, whirlpool bath, a bathtub, and bathtub, uh, they are competing on, on probability. And then this would favor um, concepts that, that either have uh, fewer surface forms that compete for probability, uh, surface forms, sorry, uh, so fewer paraphrases basically, or um, candidate answers that have the more common form, surface form of a concept. So, so here, for example, whirlpool bath is probably not as frequent as bathtub and uh, a bathtub. I'm not sure, but probably. Uh, and then um, it is competing with um, words like cup, which are much more frequent, but they're incorrect as an answer. Um, and there's a subtle point here, which is that um, you could think about it both in terms of um, different surface forms describing the same concepts, which is like paraphrases, uh, but also um, in cases where you have uh, multiple possible correct answers. Like this question, you we could think of additional uh, correct answers. Um, I think the, um, the argument holds in both cases, but we are actually uh, mostly focusing on, um, on uh, the, the first case of uh, paraphrases. Um, so, in this new paper, we suggested a new uh, score that we call uh, domain conditional PMI, um, in which um, we normalize the answer probability with this prior probability um, of, um, of the answer given some generic domain prefix. Um, so um, 
for example, here we can use a, a very a pretty generic prefix like uh, the answer is, but if we know something about the task, we can use something more specific. Uh, and then what this score measures is as opposed to uh, regular um, probability is how much more likely the answer becomes when uh, given, the uh, given the question within the specific domain. Um, and then we tested this uh, score on um, multiple or many, many multiple choice tasks and it consistently outperformed the other uh, zero shot scoring methods with both GPT-2 and GPT-3. Uh, and then hopefully this would this simple method would become a standard because currently um, I think most papers report just language model score, but there are some different um, scoring methods and it's not even always clear uh, what what was the score that was was used in in a specific paper. Uh, before I move on, uh, any questions so far? Also, I will probably um, go turn on the lights back on. <laughs> Just a second. Hey guys, any questions to, to raise for Barry? Yeah, actually I have one, but uh, let's see whether the audience have first. Sorry, I'm back and yeah. I'm ready to hear the question. We're going to have to edit this video later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I have a question. Okay. Simple one. How yeah. do you send the knowledge, common sense knowledge? Do I you do have a base? I mean, do you have to, uh, like a database which contains all the common sense knowledge? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, what is vegetable? Is carrot a vegetable? Is fish a vegetable? So in fact, the question I want to ask is, do you have the concept of subclass, superclass, inheritance? These are all in database, okay? Mm. Because when you say, okay, you know, children uh, need to eat vegetable. Mm -hmm. Can I replace the children by someone called John and then eat vegetable? Can I replace the vegetable by like carrot or tomato? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the things which I don't think, I, I'm not, I don't know very sure because I'm not in natural language processing. But these yeah. are database concepts. They are inheritance. Like all birds can fly, except Tweety Bird. Oh, that's, Something that's, like that's that, a great okay. example. <laughs> yeah. So the, this one is, you know, you have some sort of generalization. Right? You have something, a subclass, superclass, exception. Yeah. Are these concepts studied by natural language? processing people. Yeah, that's actually an excellent example because it leads me exactly to the to the second part of the talk. But but yeah, I, because the, the specifically the Tweety example is the one that I have in one of the next slides. Um, yeah, we can definitely learn something about inheritance. I think that um, this is something that existed in uh, common sense knowledge bases, especially the more extensive ones. Um, but uh, like there's a um, like one that has been developed for decades now called Psych, um, that is very extensive. And I think that really, um, they, they really made sure that there is this uh, inheritance and transitivity and uh, uh, yes. consistency. Um, unfortunately, now that we're using language models to extract knowledge, then you don't, you don't actually get this consistency. You might, um, I don't know, you might generate a fact like all, um, I don't know, like, uh, you, you could you could generate facts that actually contradict uh, each other or don't don't um, apply this inher inheritance rule. Uh, but I know some people are working on um, making language models more consistent in terms of the knowledge that they're generating. I, I haven't personally worked on that, but um, I, th I think it is important. There's definitely there are definitely issues. Um, yeah, I, I think we could we could definitely take advantage of this. Uh, inheritance because we we actually get a lot of knowledge for uh, through this um, deduction and we don't have to have every fact uh, stated in a in a data set or in um or, or in the resource that we're studying from. Uh, so I your hope your, your reasoning is just based on the, some specific domain, right? 
Um, I wasn't, yeah, I, I wasn't focusing on a specific domain. Um, I guess, yeah, you could say that the tasks that I work on, they, they're each on a specific domain, but the solutions that I uh, develop are usually more generic and then I can apply them for several tasks. Um, yeah, and also, um, I, I think I haven't said it before, but when I define common sense, then um, I'm actually trying to avoid um, referring to knowledge in a specific domain as, as common sense, because we're, we're going for the broader uh, definition of something that all adults know, as opposed to like, I don't know if you have medical knowledge, that's something that the general population doesn't know, but if you're a doctor, then you should know that. Um, so I, I'm actually working on the first type of the broader knowledge. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, hi, Ravari, I have a small question. So mm -hmm. uh, regarding to your previous slide, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, sure. Which one? Uh, ah, this one? Uh, yeah, 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 this one. I think uh, okay. yeah, I have a small question. So how? So how, how, how do you uh, design or choose what uh, pumps to use to represent the domain? Uh, so oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I think uh, according to some recent papers of pump generation, uh, that, that uh, the performance would, would vary very much if we choose a different pumps. So how, how do you address yeah. <clears throat> That's a really good question. Um, so we haven't actually, um, I don't think we've tested a lot of uh, prompts. Um, we basically just wrote one, one prompt for each task based on our knowledge of the task. Um, this example of the answer is, is, is one of the, the prompts that we use. This is like the most generic one. Um, we had like an example of, um, uh, I don't have the, the table here with, the, with all the prompts, but we have that in the paper. Uh, but for example, for uh, sentiment analysis, we can say something, something more specific, like the sentiment of the sentence is, uh, and then you have the label, which is uh, negative, positive. Uh, I think maybe, yeah, I think you're right. I think we should, we could have probably even improved the um, the performance uh, further if we um, aggregated across multiple different uh, prompts uh, for the domain. But even if you take just this um, single uh, domain uh, premise that you come up with, then um, it's it's or it already outperforms the uh, probability. Like the standard probability. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it is interesting to try that, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll move on. Okay, so the second part uh, I'm going to talk about is on uh, non-monotonic reasoning in natural language. Um, so non-monotonic reasoning is a core human reasoning ability, and that includes um, a few um, types of reasoning. One of it is abductive reasoning. Um, actually, I'm going to talk about each one of them. So abductive reasoning, counterfactual reasoning, and diffusible reasoning. In abductive reasoning, the goal is to reason about the most plausible explanation for incomplete observations. So for example, um, given the past observation that Sarah wanted to make dinner for some guests, and the future observation that she had to order pizza for her friends instead, uh, we can reason about what happened in between. Uh, for example, maybe um, she just realized that she doesn't know how to cook. Um, and uh, so this um, reasoning mode is very useful. For example, when we um, work on story understanding that we could use that to fill in gaps because um, when we tell stories, we don't really mention everything that happened because it would be a very long and boring story. Uh, but when we uh, understand stories, we complete that with our common sense knowledge. So that could be, um, the abductive reasoning could be used for that. Um, the challenge in developing an unsupervised model for this task is that um, when we base it on language models, uh, they're only conditioned on a past context. But uh, in this task, we also need to consider the future. And here, for example, if we just take this uh, past context, Sarah wanted to make dinner for some guests, and we fit it into GPT-2 and let it generate the next sentence, then uh, it tells us that um, I'm going to grab some rice noodles, she said, which doesn't make sense with respect to the future observation that she ordered pizza. Um, so our solution was to uh, compute some loss with respect to the future constraint and then back propagate it to update the output. And this is not something that is, com that is commonly done. 
uh, because typically backpropagation is used in supervised learning to update the model parameters and we're updating the, the output and we're working in, in an unsupervised setting. Um, we draw inspiration from an image style transfer model. Um, so the goal here is to uh, transfer the style of a, of a source image to the style of an input image. And uh, the way that it works is by uh, computing a loss on the output with respect to the style, then back propagating the error to update the source image. Um, so we developed DeLorean, which stands for uh, decoding for non-monotonic logical reasoning. And uh, for the abductive reasoning task, it, uh, this is a, a paper uh, from EMNLP last year. It is led by Karen from uh, UW. Um, for the abductive reasoning task, uh, we uh, have as input X, which is the past context. Sarah wanted to make dinner for some guests. Z, which is the future context. Uh, she had to order pizza for her friends instead. And the goal is to, to generate Y, which is the uh, hypothesis that is on the one hand, a fluent continuation of X, and on the other hand, also uh, satisfies the, the future constraint Z. Um, so we have an initialization step, and then we have the um, iterative backward and forward passes. Um, the initialization step, um, we, during this step, we input the, the past context into the language model, and then we predict the next N token vectors. So we don't actually sample a discrete word, we just keep the soft representation of these vectors, which we call uh, Y tilde. Um, so each vector in Y tilde corresponds to the distribution over the vocabulary for, for that given token. The backward pass is uh, responsible for instilling the task specific future constraint Z into Y. So first we uh, continue inputting the future context Z. Uh, she had to order pizza for her friends instead. And then we compute um, the task specific loss with respect to the current Y tilde and the future context Z. And we back propagate the error to update Y tilde. We, we actually keep a second copy of Y tilde, which we call uh, Y tilde backward. Um, the task specific objective for abductive reasoning is that we want to maximize the likelihood of the language model to generate the future observation Z following the the past observation X and the generated hypothesis Y. Um, and we compute it with uh, cross entropy loss of, uh, we, we just minimize the cross entropy loss of uh, predicting each token in Z given X, Y, and the prefix of Z. Um, then the forward pass is uh, responsible for generating a fluent, a continuation Y, which is fluent with the past context X. And it is uh, identical to the uh, initialization step, except that now in every step when we generate um, a token, we mix the uh, two y tilde, uh, the forward and backward uh, vectors with, in, a, in a linear combination, and then feed the mixed vector to the next step. So that we're considering both uh, past and context and, and future uh, constraints. And then the last step of each iteration is to generate a text. Um, and we do that by uh, greedily decoding a uh, token from, uh, decoding a, each vector in Y tilde to obtain a word. Um, and then we repeat this backward and forward, uh, and forward passes uh, multiple, for multiple iterations. And um, we end up with uh, multiple generated Ys uh, from which we need to select the best one. And it's not necessarily that the last one is the best uh, because we're not working in a supervised manner that we can't really learn which one is the best. Um, so we have this uh, heuristic. Uh, basically what we want is to, um, to, take the, to generate the, the, to select the Y that is the most likely to follow the past context X and to precede the future context Z. And we get this with a uh, BERT next sentence prediction score. Um, in the paper, we also have automatic evaluation metrics. Uh, here, I'm going to focus on the human evaluation metrics because um, as everyone knows, these are the metrics that actually matter for uh, generative tasks. Um, so what we did was to ask people to rate how coherent uh, the generated Ys from multiple uh, models 
where with respect to the past context X and with respect to the future context Z. Um, here we, we can see the, um, the average score across the um, different uh, instances, zero being the worst and 10 being the best. Um, so DeLorean outperforms the, the other unsupervised methods substantially. And um, it also, it, it was even competitive with the uh, supervised baselines, um, in some cases even better than them. Um, yet, if you could see that there's a really large gap from human performance, uh, so this is a difficult task. Uh, it's not yet solved in any way. And this is a repeating pattern in the, all the tasks that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and here's the example generation. Um, so again, we have the uh, past context, Sarah wanted to make dinner for some guests, and the future context, she had to order pizza for her friends instead. Um, so the first iteration generated, uh, she was thinking about the best way. This doesn't yet make sense. Um, the second one is, however, her cooking skills were the only thing that could make it a success. Again, this doesn't make sense yet, but something nice that happens from here forward is that um, once we had the first backward pass, um, this um, instill this contrast into the, the, the generated Y always starts with a contrast word because there's some contrast between the uh, past and, con and future context. And then you could say that all the uh, following generations also start with uh, but, which is also a contrast word, uh, but she couldn't because she was too busy with her work. This is actually good, uh, but she didn't have the money and she didn't have her own kitchen, uh, and, uh, but she didn't know how to cook. Um, so this was the abductive reasoning task. Uh, we also applied DeLorean for counterfactual reasoning. Um, in counterfactual reasoning, the goal is to reason about changes in outcomes given a change in condition. Uh, and this is, or put more simply, this is like answering what if questions. And this is an important ability, for example, in argument mining, um, if we want to uh, make an argument against uh, claim X, then we can suggest that uh, if X would have happened, that would result in some unwanted outcome Y. Um, similarly, when detecting misinformation, we can prove that claim X is false. If we can show that if it was true, that would entail that uh, claim Y, which is known to be false. Uh, so pretty useful. Uh, specifically, we use the tri time travel data set. Um, so um, the model gets uh, an original five sentence story, uh, for example, Lisa was throwing a Halloween party. All her friends were dressing up. Lisa thought about being a wizard. Then she decided on a scarier costume. Lisa dressed up like a vampire. Um, and then the um, second sentence is, is changed uh, with a counterfactual condition. So now instead of all her friends were dressing up, we have it was a Game of Thrones themed party. And the goal now is to generate a new um, alternative ending, which on the one hand, adheres to the counterfactual story beginning. And on the other hand, only minimally edits the original ending. We don't want to completely deviate. Um, so here's an example generation from DeLorean. Lisa thought about being, uh, sorry, Lisa thought about how she would dress up as a Lannister, but she didn't want to look like a Lannister. Then she decided on, oh, sorry, she wanted to look like Stark. Lisa dressed up like a Stark. Um, so you can see here that um, some of the, um, some content is copied from the original ending, but some content is replaced with uh, references to Game of Thrones. Uh, we define the inputs for DeLorean as X, the counterfactual story beginning, and uh, Z, the original ending. Uh, and the goal is to generate Y, which is the alternative ending. Um, the future constraint here is that we want the representation of the original ending Z to be as similar as possible to that of the alternative ending Y. And we get that by minimizing the KL divergence between the uh, one hot representation of Z and the soft representation Y tilde. Uh, and then the rest of the steps are identical. Um, so among all the models that we tested, DeLorean was the only model that achieved a good balance between uh, the, these two criteria of adhering to the counterfactual condition, but only minimally editing the original ending. Um, here's the third example of non-monotonic reasoning ability. Um, so in defeasible reasoning, the premise that uh, Tweety is a bird likely entails the hypothesis that Tweety flies. This is a famous example. Um, but if we get the additional information that Tweety is a penguin, uh, then um, this would um, invalidate the conclusion that Tweety flies. 
And this is also an important ability. Uh, for example, if we're working on uh, real-time summarization of an unfolding event, for example, if we're summarizing news events or um, news on social media, um, then we get new information and then we make intermediate conclusions and then we get new information and maybe this invalidates or updates our prior conclusions. Um, and while this was studied a lot in classical AI, um, and despite the focus of the NLP community on natural language inference, there was literally no work on diffusible natural language inference. Not at least, okay, maybe I should say not that I know of. Um, and then recently we had this uh, paper, this was last year at findings of EMNLP. Uh, and this is a paper that was led by Rachel Wurdinger, um, in which we worked on this task. We created a, the first large scale defeasible inference data sets in several domains. And we also slightly extended the task. So now an update sentence could either uh, weaken the hypothesis as in Tweety is a penguin, or it could also strengthen it. So for example, uh, if we knew that Tweety is on a tree, that would actually strengthen our belief that Tweety can fly. Um, and then we defined uh, two tasks. Uh, one of them was the discriminative task in which um, given a premise and hypothesis, uh, and an update sentence, we needed, we, the model needed to predict whether it is a strengthener or a weakener. So for example, a group of people sitting around a rectangular table having either pieces of paper or laptops in front of them um, might entail that they have a work meeting. Uh, the update that they're in a conference room strengthens it, but the update that they're in a library weakens it. Um, and this was, we actually got pretty good performance on this task, uh, but it could be due to annotation artifacts. Um, so um, the, the setting that we're actually more um, encouraging people to work on is the generative task in which um, the goal is given a premise and hypothesis to generate um, either an update, um, to generate an update sentence that is a weakener or a strengthener. Uh, and here, uh, this task was much more challenging and um, language models still leave a lot of room for improvement. Um, I'm going to quickly go over this part. Um, so as a follow-up work, we also, um, last year, um, uh, Faeze, who was an intern at AI2, um, worked on generating free text rationales that explain why a weakener weakens or why a strengthener strengthens the hypothesis. Uh, so for example, they are in a conference room, strengthens the hypothesis that they have a work meeting because that's where people have uh, meetings at work or used to have meetings before working from home. Uh, but if they're in a library, that actually weakens the hypothesis because you must be quiet in the library and typically work meetings involve talking. Um, and we developed um, models that generate these free text rationales and we uh, used distance supervision to um, train them. Um, and then we also had two types of models. One of them was the post hoc rationalization model. So basically here, uh, we're getting the decision already. So for example, we're, we're getting both the label strength in there, for example, and the, um, uh, and, and, and the uh, sorry, both the, um, we're getting all the inputs uh, and, and we only need to predict the, the rationale. Um, so, um, and, and here, you, if you look at the numbers, it seems like this model performs really well. But if you actually look at the generated rationales, you can see that they're not very good. Specifically, they very often uh, trivially rephrase the label. So for example, they predict something like um, the uh, strength in there implies that the hypothesis, or it cannot be that the weakener uh, and the hypothesis at the same time. And that's not very informative. Um, we also had a second setting, which is more realistic, in which we don't yet have the label, but the, in, instead the model needs to predict both the label, strengthener or weakener, and the, generate the rationale for it. And this turned out to be much more challenging. So here we didn't get, um, we didn't have any model that performed really well. Uh, one thing that is common for the, all the tasks that I showed in this uh, section were that they were all generative. And this is not a coincidence. It is a direction that I actually want to focus on um, because primarily, for, for now, because currently um, the norm in NLP is uh, discriminative tasks primarily because they're easy to evaluate with automatic metrics, with accuracy. 
Uh, but as we've seen earlier, they are unfortunately also easy for models to game. And uh, discriminative models are getting really good performance by being right for the wrong reasons. Oh, there is a missing word here. Um, and then there, the alternative of generative tasks is pretty promising because first of all, it allows for more nuanced and flexible reasoning than uh, if we have these predefined labels. It is also more similar to the way that we reason because we're not often provided with answer choices. And uh, it is very, um, models are unlikely to be right for the wrong reasons because there is an infinite answer space of, of all the free text answers. Uh, unfortunately, for the same reason, it's also very hard to evaluate automatically because it's hard to judge the correctness of a free text answer. And uh, to date, there is no reliable automatic evaluation metric. Um, going back to our abductive reasoning example, uh, here um, I, I gave this one example of a generated hypothesis, which was uh, she didn't know how to cook. Uh, but we could think of um, additional answers. This is actually um, an open-ended task that, that could have multiple correct answers. Um, and we would like our uh, metric to uh, reward correct answers that are different from the reference. So for example, uh, we could think of an alternative explanation that maybe Sarah uh, did cook, but right before the guest arrived, she tasted the food and it tasted really bad and she had to order pizza as a backup plan. Uh, this is the correct answer, but it's completely different from the reference. On the other hand, we, we, don't, we want the metric to penalize incorrect answers that are similar to the reference. Um, so for example, uh, she didn't know how to cook meat is uh, very lexically similar to the reference, but it is uh, incorrect because she could cook other things. And currently we either settle for uh, lexical overlap metrics such as blue and rouge that don't really recognize different correct answers or to um, semantic similarity based metrics such as bird score that um, they, they uh, seem to be rewarding uh, similar but incorrect answers. Uh, I'm gonna skip this, uh, just the, the, the rest of the slide here for the sake of time. Um, but I wanna talk about a few additional open problems. Uh, in the few minutes that we have left. Um, so all these models that I talked about, as I mentioned earlier, they're all based on language models because that that's what we have now. That's the base, best uh, tool we have now in NLP. Uh, but language models have um, various issues, one of them being uh, limited precision um, and when it comes to uh, common sense and word knowledge. Uh, so specifically, language models are not sensitive enough to negation. So for example, they can generate uh, incorrect or negated facts such as birds can't fly. Um, similarly, because they're trained in a distributional training objective, uh, they tend to confuse similar but mutually exclusive concepts. Uh, for example, um, this is an example from Jiang et al uh, from last year. Um, if you ask BERT, for example, uh, direct X is developed by, uh, you get multiple names of companies as a response and they all have similar scores, but only one of them is the correct one. Um, so it seems like BERT knows that it should be a name of a company here, but not necessarily what's the correct one. Uh, and then the way that they suggested to um, address that is by paraphrasing the prompt and then aggregating across the different answers, which we actually mentioned earlier in a different context. Um, and finally, um, language models don't differentiate constant facts such as zebras are black and white from contingent facts such as the color of my shirt, which is uh, also black and white today, but it's not always black and white. Uh, another limitation is that actually, although language models have knowledge on multiple uh, domains, they actually do lack coverage in some domains. And specifically, it has been shown that um, in terms of uh, physical properties of the world or uh, perceptual knowledge, they don't really have a good coverage. And that's because uh, these things are typically not described in text because we can, we can see them. So we don't really write about them a lot. Um, and this leads me to the next limitation for which I need to provide some background. Um, so this is reporting bias. Um, and the background is that when we were talking about, when we we're talking about uh, acquiring knowledge or specifically common sense knowledge, uh, in the past, it was common to uh, collect either collect it from people, as I mentioned earlier, the psych project, or to extract it automatically from text. 
So the first approach is not scalable because um, it's impossible to manually enumerate all the common sense knowledge. And if you try to do that, it's gonna be very costly and time consuming. Um, it could take a few decades. Um, the second approach works, but suffers from a different problem, which is reporting bias. Um, that is, people tend to speak more about the exceptional than they speak about the obvious and trivial things in life because everybody knows the trivial, so you don't actually have to speak about it. And this is reflected in text corpora. Um, for example, if you look at corpus frequencies, then you might learn something like that people murder more than they breathe. Um, and in this talk, I talked about the um, newer approach, I, I wanna say less explored, but it's quite uh, explored by now, uh, of extracting such knowledge from pre-trained language models. Um, and while, um, and, and I wanna stress that language models they don't really overcome reporting bias. Um, so on the one hand, um, they do assign non-zero probability for very trivial facts that are not frequently discussed in a corpus or appear in a corpus as is. And this is great. This is a very uh, good advancement of, upon extractive methods. At the same time, they also tend to overestimate rare actions. For example, if you um, use BERT to, um, to sort the... the uh, actions that people do on a day-to-day -day basis, basis, then it um, really exaggerates or really amplifies the, um, the uh, frequency of dying, although dying is something that happens once in a lifetime as opposed to something like breathing or talking, which is uh, happening all the time. And the, probably the reason that it happens is because BERT was primarily trained on Wikipedia and Wikipedia contains all these bios of influential but often already dead people from history. Um, and this also happens with outcomes. So for example, uh, if you ask GPT-2 uh, what happened after the man turned on the faucet, then it can generate something like the man's blood was sprayed everywhere. Uh, and this is not a one-off. This is something that happens quite often. Um, language models also memorize facts pertaining to specific named entities that are prominent in the corpus and then use them even when they're uncalled for. Uh, for example, for example, given the prefix Richard has a bad, uh, GPT-2 GPT generates habit of saying things that are not true. And that's pretty good. And also, um, uh, if you look at the attention weights, you can see that most of the attention goes to the word bad. Uh, but if you um, replace Richard by Donald, then now it predicts has a reputation of, for, for being a racist. And if you look at the attention, you can see that now equal attention is given to both Donald and bad. And this is an undesirable behavior for most applications. Um, so in general, rather than learning common sense only from text, it is beneficial to learn it from additional modalities such as images and videos that often provide complementary knowledge that is unlikely to be described in text. Uh, for example, looking at enough uh, class photos, you might learn that typically the kids in the front row are gonna be sitting. Um, you again have to be cautious about that because you might learn other types of reporting bias, uh, for example, learning from the movies that people typically hang up the phone without saying goodbye. Um, finally, we should remember that coherent and fluent language generation uh, is not, uh, does not equ equal reasoning, especially when it's very weakly conditioned and constrained. Uh, and we do have a long way to get there. Um, so this is my now favorite example using GPT-3, uh, just to show that GPT-3 is not a magic bullet and it also lacks reasoning abilities. Um, so the prompt here is that the girl spilled orange juice on herself and started crying. Why are you crying, her dad asked. Because my clothes are wet, replied the girl. And why are they wet? Because I fell in the swimming pool. And why did you fall in the swimming pool? Because I couldn't see the water, the girl replied. The moral of the story is, always wear a blindfold when you go swimming. <laughs> um, okay, so to recap, uh, I presented a framework for uh, discovering implicit knowledge through asking clarification questions. Uh, then we talked about um, new tasks and models for non-monotonic reasoning in natural language. Um, and there are many open problems. Uh, we're still a long way uh, from human level common sense reasoning abilities. In particular, we need to improve the reliability of common sense knowledge and uh, improve reasoning skills. And we need to work on more grounded models that can also 
see and hear the world and not only read about it from text. Thank you. I hope there's time left for questions. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your talk. So uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, so uh, you don't do you have any question or? Uh, no, yeah. Maybe I have a simple question. Mm -hmm. Do you use three level, three, three value logic? Answer yes, no, and I don't know. I mean, sometimes the, the question asked is incomplete. So there's no answer to value logic. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think we don't really do that. I, I think maybe even I can say broadly in NLP, we, um, because everything is based on machine learning and yeah. these models often, they don't actually know when they don't know something, uh, they just guess it anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, and it is something that is actually, um, it is a desired property for a model to be able to say, I don't know. Um, I think there's, there has been some work done on that in dialogue, uh, but um, yeah, we should be working more on that, uh, on, on recognizing when the model doesn't actually have enough knowledge um, to, to make a decision and to just output, I don't know. I have a, uh, I have a kind of a generic question. So like uh, for, for the reporting bias that, that you just mentioned, uh, uh, is there any way to like uh, systematically or quantitatively evaluate it? Mm, to evaluate where, whether your model or your- um, Yeah, suffer from this uh, reporting bias, yeah. Mm. I, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure because I, so I had, um, so I, I mentioned one of my, um, when, when I mentioned that language models don't completely overcome reporting bias, I was, um, this is based on a calling paper that I had last year. Um, but even there, I, um, I was following the same uh, experiment that, no, the similar experiments that were run by um, uh, Gordon and Van Dorme, um in 2013 for extractive methods. And it was not entirely uh, quant. It's it's not it's not it's something that's hard to quantify. It was qualitative, qualitative <laughs> based on like uh, examples mostly. Um, so it's hard. To, yeah, it's I I don't know if there's a really good way to um, to quantify this. But we could we could see based on examples that it's not uh, that it suffers from this bias. I'm not sure you, you could. I think it's easier to show that it suffers from this bias if you see if you show examples, yeah, but if yeah. you uh, end up developing the best model that doesn't suffer from that, it's going to be hard to show that it doesn't suffer from bias. Mm, yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe I have a question. Yeah. So I uh, have already. So uh, I I do have a question regarding. I mean, uh, the question like, what do you mean that you really understand common sense? This type of type of thing. So, you know, the, the main uh, motivation that uh, we are now approaching common sense is to drive language models from this, uh, something like the statistical pattern about the data set to that really understands the, the real world knowledge. But I think uh, so far we see all, all the world work, works around common sense. We are still using statistical tools or, or models towards that. So it's sort of like uh, contradictory. So what's your opinion towards that? Yeah, that, that's that's a good observation. I don't think it's contradictory. I think that um, probably, I mean, the the solution I can think about now um, is probably not the optimal solution, but um, it is to to have a newer symbolic model that does that. Mm -hmm. So you combine the flexibility of these statistical methods that don't have to have the exact verbatim uh, text in their um, in their um, data uh, with um, this more accurate um, either like um, method or, or, or data. Usually I think when people say neurosymbolic in the context of common sense in the last few years, it's mostly, it mostly means just uh, it's a neural method and it has access, access to concept net. Um, I mean, you could, we could do more, we could do like, um, uh, I mean, there, there are some other methods maybe that uh, have like uh, 
there's there's not another, another uh, method from uh, from my group, um, but neurological decoding where you. Uh -huh. um, I don't, I don't remember exactly what they did, but but this is more about the um, like the logical um, constraint okay. comes that, uh, as a method, not as a data. Um, so so yeah, that's the current solution. But probably in the future, it's also worth to try to uh, combine other modalities or other methods. Thank you very much for your answer. Thanks. Okay, uh, actually here I have a quick question regarding um, the, uh, I mean, when we try to solve the problem, we try to uh, rely on language model as a common sense uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, source to provide the knowledge. But we also understand that uh, the limitations of this language models, uh, because the way they are trained and the, the kind of things they're able to capture. So my question is that for the similar kind of a task, is it going to be a, um, easier task or challenging task if applied to a domain specific way. For example, we have a bio bird to be trained on all the biomedical uh, literatures, right? So we have a language model for this bio domain. Um, and in fact, all the tasks uh, described here can be applied uh, to that domain as well. So within this domain boundary, are we seeing a easier task or are we seeing, seeing a tougher task? I mean, in your understanding. Um. I, I don't know because I haven't worked on specific domains, um, so I, I I don't know if it's easier or harder. I do think that um, it's good to have this um, common ground of having these representations because I'm thinking just like a few years ago when we didn't have these pre-trained language models, then every task, every model had to learn from scratch um, the representation of words to learn the language and, and only then start to learn how to perform the task. Or like, I don't know, a few years ago, we had word amenings, but we still had to uh, train some RNN to learn how to compose them into representations of phrases and sentences. So I do think it's, it's a really good basis. Um, but I, um, I also don't think it's reasonable to expect it to know everything about, about all the domains. And so I think it is important to um, do some kind of a transfer learning or, um, or use additional resources when working on specific uh, specific domains. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, any more questions? Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, I hear someone. It's okay. Okay. Maybe I can ask. Okay. Whether okay, when you do this sort of thing. Whether the learning, if the interactive, uh, because you, you don't have that knowledge, but during the interactive, you know, question answering, okay, you may get some answer, and whether this answer is become a knowledge, and then you put that inside your knowledge base. This is how human learn. When you learn something, you, you may not know anything, and no, don't know this one. But after interaction, after learn that, they will know this is a fact. So next time you, you will get the answer directly without going through all this inferencing or whatever. I mean, interactive knowledge, accuracy, uh, knowledge uh, gathering, and then store inside your database, your, your knowledge base. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. So um, yeah, I haven't implemented that in self talk. So if you if you come across um, two contexts that um, require the same kind of knowledge, you, you're going to have to generate it twice. Uh, maybe maybe also the model yeah. wouldn't be able to generate it based on the new context, and, as opposed to if you, like, as humans learn and they just can, they can just retrieve it from the memory. Yeah, so yeah, I do yes. think that, yeah, there are, I mean, there are some methods for other tasks that do yeah. have a memory, uh, including a paper that I was involved in that I, I didn't mention. Um, but um, yeah, we, I think most tasks don't have this memory. Most models don't, have, don't use a memory. Because uh, deep learning now current the problem is they don't use knowledge base. They everything learn from facts. Yeah, and I they think that- they learn some new thing, okay. They don't yeah. oh, as the knowledge. They mean everything need to go and do some sort of inferencing. That's bad. 
Yeah, I think that specifically in in um, in the sub community of people working on common sense uh, in in NLP, I think there's actually a lot of usage of uh, more than average usage of uh, knowledge bases because um, there's the concept net knowledge base which is pretty extensive. It's not exhaustive in any way, but it is pretty ex extensive. So uh, people have been using that. It has shown to contribute to the um, performance on multiple tasks. Uh, but um, but yeah, in general, in NLP, we don't use enough uh, external knowledge. We just uh, expect to learn everything from scratch from the training data, which is, I think it's not really good, yeah. This is my comment, okay. If everything learned from data, not from previous knowledge, when going back, going back to the Stone Age era, then everything must learn from data. So yeah. maybe we don't accumulate the knowledge for future use. That's a very bad thing. Right. Yeah, and you can say even more than that that um, people learn to um, to to perform new tasks based on their knowledge of previous tasks, but actually we're not really. Um, the, the closest to that we have now is taking the same pre-trained language model like BERT and just fine tuning it from scratch every time for a different task. I mean, we do uh, have some, like some people do transfer learning, but it's not the standard. The standard is just you take this representation and you just tra train it from scratch for each, not even, not just each task, but also each data set. If you have two uh, question answering data sets, you're gonna train them separately for each question answering data set. So, yeah, there's not a lot of um, learning from previous examples, or just learning from the specific training sets. And I, I agree, it's not the most, it's not the optimal way. It's, it's definitely not the way that humans learn. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So uh, yeah, I think uh, we are a bit of uh, over time, so I think we can end here. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for various talk and uh, uh, thank you all for uh, attending. Uh, okay, so due to the time, uh, we'll uh, have a short discussion with you. So after the talk, I think. Okay. okay.